Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Max, you're okay? Excellent. Thanks very much. I appreciate the professionalism of the forum and the, uh, the team from Swiss TV because they're extremely efficient. We have some of those at the back of the door if you want to come in and sit down. Even if you're in security, you don't have to stand for the next hour. <laughs> I, I don't think the deputy prime ministers want the security guys with very sore legs later. Is that right? They're independent, he said. Okay, very good. Okay, this is, these are not the best of times, I, I would suggest, right now in 2015, but obviously they're not the worst of times as well. Uh, but I think it's fair to say they are harder times uh, to grow, and hence the title of our uh, program today, Growing in Harder Times in 2015. A bit of irony here, the United States is growing quite handsomely, uh, probably 35 to 4% in 2015, but this is the economy that sparked the global financial crisis uh, back in 2008 and 2009. Uh, the Eurozone is going to be lucky to grow 1% to 1.2%, but at least we know uh, at this stage what the European Central Bank has plans for. Uh, it's pulled out a pretty good-sized bazooka, better than a trillion dollars, over an 18-month period uh, to try to boost growth in Europe. Big debate, of course, uh, with Germany uh, suggesting that uh, austerity and discipline and reforms should continue uh, to go forward. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, this weekend we have the Greek election, of course. We could have the Grexit, depending on which way the voters go, uh, and whether the Greeks can participate in that program or not, depending on the progression of the European Union, IMF, ECB uh, bailout plan that's on the table. So what does this mean about the engines of global growth? We often talk about the emerging markets being the engines of global growth. Uh, they're struggling a little bit. Uh, China was growing 7.4% last year. That would be the envy of the world for everybody else, I would think. But there's concerns that it will surrender 7% uh, this year. But let's take a look at a video report that outlines the IMF forecast for 2015, and we'll pick up our discussion thereafter. Please go ahead and roll the video. The United States, the country that many say was the spark behind the 2008 global financial crisis, is now moving full steam ahead. Unemployment is below 6 percent, growth hovering around 4 percent. The largest emerging market, China, is growing at the slowest pace in nearly a quarter century. But President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang seem determined to try and defend 7 percent growth. But the real question marks for 2015 are not the world's number one and two-sized economies, but global risks linked to the collapse of oil prices and potential deflation. Yemen, Libya, and Iraq remain tension-filled hotspots and will feel the strain of a drop in revenues, as will Nigeria and, of course, Russia, as one of the world's top three energy producers. This is a look through the IMF's 2015 crystal ball. Global growth of 3.5%, down from 3.8% last October. China to expand 6.8% and slightly less next year. Russia to contract by 3%, a steep revision from last October. Nigeria 4.8%, 2.5% below the autumn forecast. Mexico is expected to grow just above 3%, and Turkey at 3%. The one caveat here, the IMF has been traditionally optimistic, and as a result has had to ratchet down forecasts, and many believe that may be the case later this year. So that gives us a very good indication of where we are uh, in January 2015. Of course, the reason we wanted to talk about the political risk thereafter is because this could all be thrown off by uh, very sudden or shocking events. But let's start with the Deputy Prime Minister of Turkey, a 3% forecast with what the European Union has decided to do with stimulus here. Could you surpass that number in 2015? Well, I think it's a reality which we have to see that last 10 years versus next 10 years, it will be a different era for emerging markets. The average growth rates will go down compared to last 10 years. But the lower growth rates are even going to be still higher than the growth rates of the developed countries. Mm. So when we talk about lower growth rate for Turkey or for China or for other countries, these will be still on average much higher than the developed world. For Turkey specific, if the lower oil prices and the measures that we are taking to diversify our export markets have been working very well. Maybe European markets are not performing well, but our exports to Africa, to Asia, Latin America is growing very fast. We had only 12 embassies in Africa in 2008. Today we have 39 embassies. Turkish Airlines fly to more than 40 mm -hmm. destinations and the trade is growing. 
So in a way, time diversification of markets and time diversification of the product range helps a lot in these kind of times. Deputy Prime Minister Shuvala, this is probably one of the most difficult years for uh, President Vladimir Putin and the Russian economy. Sanctions are in place. Uh, we're looking at potentially, according to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, a contraction of nearly 5%. The IMF puts it at 3%. How do you navigate very choppy waters with the political situation you're faced with with the European Union and the United States? But that's not the first time. You know, if we recall different crises in my country, this may be, I recall the fourth one. And in 2007, the oil price dropped again dramatically and, you know, we survived and two years later we felt much stronger. This time again, the forecasts are different. This, you know, forecast is possible. This is a possible scenario, but at the same time we have a, maybe a scenario where we will be around zero. It means the economy is freezing. The half of our oil incomes will disappear, but at the same time we understand there is a structural need to perform something else and to find new markets for our export goods which was not the, uh, you know, the agenda for Russians before, because it was you know, money in coming from selling oil and gas. So this is another challenge, but I think we will scope. As you know, there's been talk of reform for a decade in Russia and the discussion to look for other markets and tilt to the east. The reality is uh, this government got a little bit spoiled by $100 oil, and that That's uh, right. first yeah, all the reforms. I have to admit, you're right, we were spoiled, spoiled by these numbers, and people were just expecting new numbers of, you know, public expenditures. And people were, you know, they were not motivated to work harder, to provide labor productivity, but now this is the case where we will do this, because we are forced. Maurice Levy, you have a, a very good uh, you know, finger on the pulse of global growth as uh, the CEO of one of the largest advertising firms in, in the world. But I wanted to get your thoughts on the European Central Bank's actions here on the, the quantitative easing. Will it provide finally the stimulus, even though it's six years late or six years after the US Federal Reserve? President Draghi is going a little bit beyond the, the mandate. And that is the reason why it has taken so long to come to that kind of stimulus. Uh, and it will act as a stimulus. What I would be very much worried about is that um, uh, leaders believe that this will be enough and that, that sh they should not go through the reform program that we have absolutely to implement in some countries, mm. including mine. So it is extremely important to see that as a uh, uh, something which is relaxing a little bit the economy and uh, easing uh, uh, the balance sheet of the, the banks, and, uh, at the, but not the final solution to the austerity and to believe that uh, uh, all our issues are behind us. No, the issues are still there, and we have to go through a very serious uh, reform program, particularly in the uh, southern part of Europe. I, I find it fascinating that people start to panic about China when it's you know hovers at 7.4 percent. It's a, a big tanker ship you have to you know to move, of course. But President Xi and Premier Li, and we heard him here at the World Economic Forum, believe they can defend at 7 percent. Bo Cheng Ling, do you think it's uh, going to be 7 percent or higher? We should be happy about a softer landing for China. I believe that uh, there will be still higher than 7 percent. The IMF estimate is a bit low. Uh, the reason for that is very simple. Urbanization is uh, continuing. And, uh, Chinese savings are extremely high, and those are real money. And uh, you know, inflation is low. So that if China, Chinese government just uh, spend a little bit, uh, it, it will be 7%. Having said that, uh, I think that's the difficulties. The difficulty here is that uh, we get used to 10% growth. Hmm. Now with 7.4%, uh, 7, 7 you still really need to go through the reform structure changes and others to really address that 3% difference associated with the social economic problems. So I think China still have to work hard, but I believe that 7%, above 7% is achievable. You're not concerned about the social unrest because it's not reaching beyond the major large cities of China yet. The wealth is not trickling outside the major hubs of manufacturing and finance. Precisely, not yet. I think that the, 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 the 
growth will continue, even though that, uh, for example, like housing, we have got a problem with the housing market. But I think there are tremendous infrastructure need to be built in other, you know, the second tier, third tier uh, cities. So uh, I think that the, the, we, the, the growth momentum is still there. Emilio Lozoya of uh, Pemex, you're neighboring Mexico, of course, to the United States. The U.S. is growing like great gangbusters after all that quantitative easing. But we're not seeing the growth that we saw in Mexico three years ago, uh, not to 4%, not to march to 5%. What's hurting Mexico right now from popping above that level? Well, indeed, uh, 2015 uh, is a complex scenario for the world economy. And what is Mexico doing in this context? Uh, we're committed to fiscal discipline and macroeconomic stability, as we have done in the last 20 years. We expect uh, growth a little bit higher than the IMF is predicting, in the range of 35 to 3.9%, mm. despite low oil prices. Uh, but I think, paradoxically, the low oil prices, people believe, is going to have a higher impact on Mexico's GDP. Uh, the GDP related to oil is, has been less than 8% for the last years. So actually, we will benefit more from a stronger economy. The numbers are encouraging. In 2014, uh, October year-to-year -year figures, uh, our 8% increase exports uh, of automobiles to the United States, 20% increase in manufacturing exports to the US, which is 80% of our trade. And uh, the economy created uh, 950,000 jobs in 2014. So the numbers mm. are good. It could be better if we had better oil prices. But the economy is moving. Mexico is fully committed also to implementing the 11 structural reforms that were approved. The, we've done the first part, which is to approve them through the legislation. Uh, but now we have to implement them. And that's the encouraging part. I think 2015 is going to be a good year for Mexico, despite the risks out there uh, that you have clearly mentioned. Uh, the African Renaissance. We were all excited in Davos 2014 about Africa finally getting its opportunity in the global spotlight. I found it uh, fascinating, Patrice Mosepi, that uh, Nigeria has seen one of the sharpest downgrades of growth for 2015, uh, negative 2.5% off of the top line number of last year, and they're projecting growth of just 4.8% for Nigeria. South Africa is struggling to get above 1.5%. What's holding back Africa? Still too dependent on commodities, in your view? Well, um, currently there's approximately 750 uh, million mobile users in Africa, double the size of, of uh, the United States. Mm. Uh, pa over the past year, approximately 80 billion US dollars was spent on infrastructure. Uh, Nigeria, Angola, and those countries, uh, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, that uh, were primarily oil producing countries in the past, have, uh, it's quite impress impressive that they've built some foreign reserves. I think Nigeria's got uh, approximately 20 billion US uh, foreign reserve. And uh, Angola has got uh, about 15 to 17 billion US dollars foreign reserve. So, and of course, we have been uh, impacted by uh, uh, the decrease in precious metals, copper, and the ores. But the, the, those traditional commodity uh, sectors of the economy are now being replaced by financial services, telecommunications, retail, and manufacturing industry is growing, and, and that continues to give, uh, to give us confidence for the future. It seems like Africa, ironically, because China was investing into Africa and had this uh, FDI, but Africa is very dependent on Chinese growth for exports for uh, your company in particular. Are you concerned uh, about the Chinese slowdown and the demand for your products at this stage? You know, it's interesting. 15% uh, of the current trade that Sub-Saharan Africa is conducting is, is with China. Let me give you a few numbers. Uh, Africa's trade with Europe is in excess of 400 billion US. Africa's trade with China is in excess of 200 billion US. So the EU collectively is still uh, a significant and a huge trading partner of Africa. Of course, China is the single largest economy that trades with Africa. It will, China's growth will indeed have an impact, but it's also important that you know, Africa's trading with India, is trading with Brazil, is trading with uh, Russia is trading with various other emerging economies. And America's growth is, is a very positive uh, development for Africa. What is lacking in Africa, Patrice Mosepi, though? Is it infrastructure spending that needs to come in to provide the efficiency for investors coming from the outside, have those goods go to market faster, and not be so reliant on commodities? After all, 
60% of the exports are still relying on oil in Africa, which is a surprising number. Very important. Uh, Africa's economies historically have been geared towards the export of commodities to historically to the European markets. The, the intra-African trade hasn't been as significant as it can be. Over the last five to 10 years, there's been significant growth. Uh, last year alone, uh, in excess of $20 billion was spent on infrastructure in Africa by the private sector, both uh, uh, private sector from outside Africa and private sector from, uh, from the continent. So the, the infrastructure is very important and uh, lots of the governments are spending more money on education, provision of skills. There's a middle class that's coming up and that middle class, uh, more educated, more in touch with the rest of the world, uh, provides an exciting market for intra-African trade as well as for the growth of the domestic economies. I want to take a look at the connection between politics and economics and how it filters into growth and opportunity for societies. Uh, let's start with Turkey. We have a very powerful president uh, evolving that uh, role as an executive president. Some would suggest that uh, President Erdogan has too tight a grip on power and is not as free Turkey as it was before. Too much concentration. In fact, there was worries that you would keep your job and the international investors uh, love having you in that role as the DPM in charge of economic policy. What's the answer to that? What's the real answer, Deputy Prime Minister? Well, first of all, Turkey is a democracy and the quality of our democracy has been going up and up. We have elections this year we had two elections last year, local elections and then presidential elections, and now general elections are coming up. So our democracy is being tested over and over again, and we are asking over and over again our people, what do you like? What kind of a government you would like to see? And uh, the, the, it, it seems like our people uh, likes our government, and they like us to just to continue. Mm. And the thing is that, uh, the democracy is also very important to go with rule of law and good practice of human rights and freedoms. And in, as in a fact, country, if I can a, interject here, yeah. this is a president, even as prime minister, a severe crackdown on the media, so severe restraint on the judiciary bodies. Anytime there's an investigation against the government, he intervenes. Uh, let, let's be candid here. And that doesn't seem to be the character uh, of, of a democracy. Well, Turkey has a very strong external anchor when we talk about the quality of our democracy or when we look at our practice of freedoms, rule of law, and so forth. And that is the European Union process. So our democracy is being assessed continuously from outside by the European Commission and the European Parliament. And in that way, we are able to judge ourselves, the performance, and do whatever we can to improve in all the senses. But most of the problematic areas which you are mentioning has a lot to do also the transition period that we have been going through, mm. the very peculiar domestic set of uh, political events that we have went through. But I, would, I can easily say that we have right now uh, more than 400 TV channels, 1,100 radio channels, and a very vivid media. And out of the first five newspapers in Turkey, Actually, you will see there's only one pro-government newspaper and the others are whether more, let's say, objective or less so and so forth. So uh, I think the, the, the perception versus what is really going on ground, there is a discrepancy. And that discrepancy could be probably corrected, but uh, even for the media that you have been uh, referring to, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, just the, the fact that this is private sector, the fact that uh, there are so many different companies and so many different uh, internet media also, mm -hmm. which, is, which is just booming in the, in, the, in the country. And being such an open country and an open democracy, it is not really easy to control uh, everything. Maybe it's not good to try to control everything anyway. And like I, shutting I think, down YouTube or Twitter. Well, that had some, some security issues, as you know. The, the reason why we had to do it was because of the very, very confidential and oh. top secret uh, recordings of our security meetings were leaked into YouTube and because of the very se severe security threat we had to do it on a very short while but then uh, we passed a law through our parliament to give that authority mostly to our courts to do what is necessary and whenever is necessary. Maurice Levin, when you look at different emerging markets because you play all around the world as a businessman what are the top three priorities when you tick the boxes to say I'm willing to put publicis funds to play here and I know it's higher risk, but I get higher rewards if the growth is there. The most interesting emerging market today is the uh, United States of America. <laughs> uh, when you look at the rate of growth, uh, 
uh, the morale of the consumers, the morale of uh, uh, the CEOs, you believe that, yes, you can invest. But uh, when you look at the emerging market more seriously, uh, you, you cannot look uh, at this as a block. Each country is different, and each country has its own uh, history. And uh, the idea of the BRICS or the MISAT is something which is no longer valid. Mm. So uh, definitely China, we, we have to invest, and we have to continue to invest in China. This is something which is extremely important, not only because of the size of the market, but also because of the prospects for the future. Even if they are going through a bump and uh, there is some issues and it's uh, 6.8 or 6.5 compared to 7.4, it's not a big problem because uh, at the point in time, I think uh, uh, being at seven will be uh, quite, quite a, 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 a good outcome mm. compared to some other countries. Uh, we, we like very much uh, uh, Mexico because of the proximity with the U.S. and uh, the way Mexico has uh, changed the policy recently. And we believe that Mexico is a good bet for us. Mm. Uh, uh, Turkey is a very interesting country. And, uh, I'm always leery when somebody says interesting because it's like a... A paragraph there going, I'm interested, but... No, no, but, no, it's it's in, but there, no, it's... no, 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 it's... Uh, OK, you want me to be more positive? I would be more positive. Uh, <laughs> that was, it, it that wasn't more, what I was getting at. It, it would be a much more interesting country if they were using our services. Oh, right. OK. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, but uh, in, in Turkey, there is a lot of possibility because there is something which is quite interesting. There is a lot of entrepreneurs. And that is something which is building the future. Entrepreneurs are the one who are building from a relatively small company, something which will become big, and we believe this will be extremely interesting. We have, sorry to say that, a little bit of concern regarding Russia. Not so Why? much uh, uh, <laughs> big of the oil. Why? It's still very good. <laughs> uh, we, we are investing in Russia, but we believe that um, we have to uh, see how things will be settled not only regarding uh, the issue with Ukraine, but also what will happen to the rubles and how the economy will be taking off. So this is uh, just a, a, a small picture. Uh, there are some other countries which uh, are extremely interesting, but the, I would like to move to Europe because Europe is probably a good bet for the future. Uh, Europe is at a very low level of growth, uh, and there is a lot of opportunity to invest in Europe. And I think that there will be a point where we will see the inversion and finally Europe will take off. And the day Europe will take off, it's much better to have a much stronger position in those countries. Okay, very good. I want to bring up the second topic uh, here, and that is the falling price of oil uh, since June of last year. $115 a barrel down to below 50 today. Very key topics. It influences the different economies around the uh, the arc here in a very different way. Uh, let's start with uh, the passing of King Abdullah and the strategy of Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, Mr. Lin, I think it would be a good place to start is with China. I mean, this is a strategy here from Saudi Arabia. Uh, what influence will the passing of King Abdullah have on that policy? And how has the energy scenario changed the outlook for China's growth? We really hope that it will not change the strategy at this moment. <laughs> the low oil price is really good for China uh, in several Express. For one thing, that if the current oil price of 40, 50 continue for another six months, China will save about 100 billion US dollars. You don't have to do anything, just sit there. Second is that uh, the China is good for China's strategic reserve, which only have, we don't have enough days. We target 90 days, but obviously much less than that. Another thing is also good for the China's uh, going out. Uh, China's falling, uh, the oil dependency is roughly 60% at this moment. And last year, we put in about 23.4 million units of car on the street. Mm. Okay, and that converted to 3 to 4% of the oil, oil demand. Mm. And given that the oil consumption is roughly 40% in the transportation. So I think that uh, China's oil demand is still there, and where the foreign dependency possibly will need to go up. So this is a, really a good opportunity for China to going out, you know, by the, our friend. Let's Russia. shift to the yeah. oil producers. Uh, let's sh shift to the oil producers and start with Russia. 
uh, Deputy Prime Minister Shuvalov. Many think that Saudi Arabia has been targeting Russia, targeting the U.S. shale producers. It is a fight over market share. How do you counterbalance this downward pressure when your export earnings are so dependent on oil? First, I would say that rubble will, after depreciation, dramatically appreciate. So no worries. <laughs> and uh, after high volatility, I think it will be very stable for a while. And so uh, there is no, you know, scary about this. Um, our dependence on oil, you know, it's, it's known, nothing new. We knew and for many years. Uh, it started in the Soviet Union, back in the Soviet Union, and we recall the times in mid-80s when the Soviet Union started suffering from lower oil prices. Now again, is the structure of our economy still the same? Of course not. It changed a lot. But we cannot say that we are independent from oil revenues. But at the, in the current in the moment, I think our, our budgetary revenues much less dependent on oil and gas than it was 10 years ago. Mm. Now it's around 50%. Before it was much higher. The structure is shifting, but slowly. Um, nothing good for us at the moment. 2015 is going to be a hard year. But at the same time, as again, your first question, it will force us to provide better st structure for the economy for the next decade. This very hard agenda, but we are focused on it. Um, hmm. With China, they are interested in lower prices, but at the same time, we are interested in very good customers. China maybe is going to be number one customer for Russia because they are a very predictable and good partner. And they say, what, what, whatever prices, but we will consume. And for Russian producers, they are very important to have predictable lines and understanding how they can produce and sell. So in all this you know, very complicated picture, we are quite sure that with China and other consumers, including EU, EU is a very good uh, partner for Russia for consuming oil and gas. But at the same time, uh, we understand that we cannot afford to leave the same standards as we got used for, you know, for the period of 15 years. It was a very good period. We were able to achieve a lot. The country is not that poor as we started in 2000 year or 1999. So, you know, this is a big, strong economy with its difficulties, as everybody has in, its, in their country's difficulties. But now the understanding that we cannot afford living the same and based on high oil prices, it's obvious. And this is good that we understand this. I, I want to pinpoint the question in the oil market today. Is this fight by Saudi Arabia for market share? Can we find common ground with Russia and the United States so we don't debilitate future investment into oil? $50 is very painful for Russia. $50 price is not painful for oil companies. It's painful for the country because of the revenues. Mm. But if you speak with Luke Oil, I see the president of the company here and other producers, $50 uh, you know, dollar per barrel is OK for them. They will be very good developing companies. They will sell their products. It's OK. It will be very painful for us, for the government and for the, the regional governments to how to produce the same uh, life you know, standards and you know, for the things we got used to including many things we import, we buy from abroad. So, but again, so for the oil producers, it's okay, this price. Mm. And so they will be very competitive. Of course, they are not producing, their costs much higher than in, in the Gulf countries, but they, they will be competitive. But for the budget, budgetary purposes, it's very painful. Mr. Lozoya, how do you see this uh, playing out? Mexico was at the OPEC meeting before it started in November, where I was there to cover it. Uh, they tried to have this cooperation between OPEC and non-OPEC producers, and it didn't amount to, to anything. Do you actually see in 2015 where a dialogue would take place between non-OPEC players like Russia, Mexico, and OPEC to lift this price, or those days are long gone? I think the, the OPEC has a clear policy, which is to continue production at around 30 million barrels per day. They have done so in the last decade, and they will not change it. And they are the most efficient producers. And uh, at current prices, they will take away the marginal producers, in particular those in the United States that have costs per barrel uh, above $40. Uh, 
And I think that's a fact of the market. If I was a banker financing this company in the US, I would be worried. No? Uh, in the case of Mexico, we are in, the, in a different bucket. Uh, Pemex's production cost is $23 per barrel. So we are still a very profitable company at current levels. As the Deputy Prime Minister was mentioning, for Pemex, it's uh, painful in cash flows. But in particular, it's difficult not uh, for Pemex, but for the revenues that the government receives, which is 30%. Mm. However, Mexico was very prudent in this sense. And uh, the government hedged the to the, the, all the, re the oil revenues for 2015 at $79. So the expenditures by the government in 2015 are covered. Uh, it will have a, an impact on GDP, as I mentioned. A marginal one, uh, it could be over 4% our GDP if prices were not at current levels. But I think the question is, uh, we have to diver differentiate the energy cycles from the financial cycles. Financial cycles in one, two years, that's a long term. For the energy sector, 15 years is a medium term. All our projects are long term. And if you look at the official estimates, not our own estimates, by the Energy, uh, uh, International Energy Association, by 2030, total demand will be 120 million barrels per day. So we need 25 more million barrels per day in the next uh, decades. Mm. Where will that come from? From very complex projects. Those projects are frontier, in the frontier markets, and we need the capital investments to be done. So at current prices, no company will do them. So I think uh, prices will be elsewhere uh, sometime. It depends how long they stay at current levels, how much pain, uh, the, I would say, the more costly producers uh, face. Uh, but I am, uh, in the context of Mexico, going back to my country, uh, we have just concluded an energy reform that is historic. We're opening up uh, the energy sector for the first time in 75 years. And as our co production costs are competitive, I was mentioning the $23 figure, we expect, despite the current prices, investment to come in, lift production, and be ready to have our production higher when prices are higher, because they will clearly be higher at some point in the, near in, in the future. Patrice Mosepi, it's interesting. Uh, Tanzania, Mozambique, great natural gas finds. Uh, that was going to counterbalance Nigeria, which is going through a very difficult time right now because it's competing in a much more competitive oil market. Does the great dream of big oil and gas development in East Africa and expansion in Nigeria go away now or just get postponed? Well, uh, these are long-term investments. I mean, w when we, uh, in our industry, for example, which is uh, mining industry, we, we, we commit significant resources for the next 10, 15, 20 years. And uh, th those projects that are underway in uh, uh, Tanzania, in uh, Kenya, and elsewhere on the continent will continue. But uh, the, the interesting thing is that the reduced oil price is, is a double-edged sword. For those non-oil uh, producing countries on the continent, uh, th this will have a huge impact on a reduced inflation and more money in the pockets of the consumers. W what is also interesting is if you look at some of the fastest growing economies in Africa, those uh, over the last 10 years, some of them are neither oil producing economies, neither, nor are they your traditional uh, ore or mining export economies, Ethiopia, uh, Kenya itself, mm. Burkina Faso, Rwanda. But the, the oil, the, the projects that uh, were initiated that you start, that you refer to are long-term projects. And, and we, we remain optimistic that, uh, that they will uh, contribute towards the growth of the African economy. Okay, third block of our program here, uh, and this is gonna be on geopolitical risk, and I'd ask our panelists to be very tight, and I wanna allow that uh, 10, 12 minutes to the floor for questions here. Um, we saw a kind of uh, Islamic radicalism, if I can say that, uh, burst onto the scene here in France. Uh, Maurice Levy, would you suggest this is the greatest geopolitical risk in Europe uh, today? I don't believe that it is only in Europe. I think it's uh, the radical uh, terror that we are seeing today. It's something which is blind. And uh, you have uh, not one organization which is acting. You have a lot of people who can act on behalf of that organization anywhere in the world. And uh, what, what has been uh, quite impressive is uh, the response of the people. And uh, I thought that uh, finally, after uh, all, all this uh, 
painful moment and the extremely dramatic moment. Uh, you, you saw the, the rebound of the people. We, we are all thinking that France was tired, depressed, and we had no longer the ability of jumping again. And uh, you saw four million people in the streets and the solidarity of the world, which has been enormous. The response of the world has been just incredible to see all these head of states marching in Paris. Uh, I was marching, I can tell you. Um, I, I am Charlie. And uh, it was extremely impressive. And I believe that um, we can expect a lot of uh, terrorist acts uh, in many places. And it is something which cannot be predictable, which can happen anywhere, can happen in Argentina, uh, it can happen in, in Turkey, uh, uh, in, in Russia, in any given country. In the US, and uh, we know that there is a lot of uh, events which can have been stopped. And if um, I can share something with you, which is uh, a, during the meeting we had at the IBC, we were asking the people what was the more threatening issue for the future. It was a geopolitical event. And behind this world, there is the, obviously the terror which can happen uh, suddenly. So we, we have to get used to that. And we have to think that uh, life is stronger than fear and hope is much stronger than uh, being scared. And we, we have to fight against terror. And they believe we are ready. Uh, Turkey lives in probably the roughest neighborhood. You have Syria to the south. ISIS has taken territory in Syria uh, and Iraq. What would you put as the number one geopolitical risk for you or strategic security risk for Turkey now? Well, first of all, uh, terror does not have religion. Terror does not have nationality. Uh, terrorism is a global problem which does need a united effort, an international effort to cope with. So we cannot... Uh, identify terror with any region of the par world or any uh, ethnic origin or any religion or whatsoever. So I think as a principle, as a principle, we have to have a very united stance. And uh, we had unfortunate events in, 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 in Paris and uh, many actual leaders, including uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, uh, Mahmoud Abbas of Palestine, my prime minister, Davutoglu, they were all there to stay united against, against terror. Uh, so I think that as a principle is very important. And on the other hand, I think we should be uh, looking at this terror or extremism uh, from a, a global point of view and also realize that in Europe especially there are some rising uh, dangerous trends. Uh, Islamophobia, xenophobia, nationalist trends, these are actually all the things that we have to be careful about. Just in last one month in Germany, 94 mosques were burned down. So. Uh, so it is very important, I think, for the political leaders to stay united and to have one single approach of terror, terrorist of any kind, extremist of, of any kind. So in Syria, it is a big mm. problem. In, in Syria, it was originally the regime and the rebellion fighting against each other. But then we have now not only ISIS, but also PYD and many other terrorist organizations fighting with each other, fighting with regime and so forth. Uh, and and uh, I think, again, the problem with Syria, right on our border, is that we don't really see a single united stance for what kind of a solution we want to find for Syria. Only military means is not enough to solve terrorism problem. If you think that you can use just weapons to kill terrorists and the terror will end is not the case. We, there should be more of an integrated, comprehensive approach and using many different tools, the political tools, the social tools, economic tools, intelligence tools, in an integrated way and in a united manner, so that only we can uh, solve this problem. Deputy Prime Minister Shubalov, uh, a Russian executive, said something very prescient, I thought. He said, it's very hard to see a solution with Russia and Ukraine when it's gotten so personal between President Putin, uh, US President Barack Obama, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. It's become so personal that there's no easy exit out of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. That has to be the number one risk, and I don't see an easy solution to it as we go into 2015. I disagree. I understand that now everybody is speaking about Ukraine when the subject is about Russia, but that's not the case. I agree that number one geopolitical risk at the moment, terror threat. 
And when everything started in Syria, uh, my president was very strong addressing to the American uh, nation and American uh, president and speaking with the European leaders that uh, Syria is not our neighbor, but so close. And the whole region is mm, very fragile. Once uh, any uh, military operation starts, it could influence our peaceful existing immediately. And pe Russian people don't feel safe when, you know, people in the States talk about any possible mi military action in Syria or in Iran or elsewhere. So, and at the same time, you need to remember the, you know, the size of my country. It's huge. We start from the Baltic seas, you know, and then uh, the ocean, the Pacific Ocean is the next edge. So when something happens in Iran or Syria, Turkey, we feel it, and we feel it strongly. Uh, of course, Ukraine. Ukraine is not only our neighbor. It, you know, we feel Ukrainians as our friends, family members. I don't know. I don't know how to call them. They're so close to us. So many Ukrainians living in Russia. So many. Russians living in Ukraine. So one would argue you like them so much, you've gone into the eastern half of the country. Uh, no, we, uh, yeah, I know those jokes, but you know. No, I, not, I don't mean that as a joke, actually. Uh, but. Actually, we are not meaning anything, and I didn't hear from anything from my president or prime minister, meaning that, you know, we have interests to separate these regions from Ukraine. We are interested in having whole Ukraine as it is, as the sovereign country. The only thing we want to stop the war, because that war influences us, and this geopolitical risk, but not the major one, because all regional wars, all regional conflicts will influence Russia and um, people who are going to invest. The, they, they don't feel safe. Mm. That's not only the investment climate. People are always talking about investment climate. They will say how we mm, feel with our mm, friend China, and for the last decade, our relationship became much better. So people are coming and invest in the neighbor regions from outside. And we see not only Chinese investors from Korea, from Japan and others, even American and Canadian companies investing there. But before, I think it was impossible because for them it was a real risk. So now, mm. you know, at some part of my country, it's becoming safer. And some where it is Ukraine or closer to those regions where the Middle East is. So that's more dangerous. And again, I would repeat it. And I agree, geopolitical risk number one for 15. And maybe next year's will be terror threat. Patrice Mosepi, very quickly here because of time. Uh, Africa has not been uh, untouched by terror. Boko Haram right at the heart of it. Kenya's had its challenges. Algeria's had its challenges. Mali's had its challenges. Uh, can we get these pockets of terror uh, in Africa under control, in Kenya, in Nigeria, Mali, uh, southeast Algeria that we saw in the past year and a half? Uh, uh, terror is not uh, uh, confined to any specific area, whether it's Africa or any other part. It's, it's a global threat and it's a global challenge and requires global cooperation. But there is a, a huge determination uh, to deal with uh, the terror and the threats in, in those areas that you've identified in. The United Nations is playing a role. Some of the, the African Union is contributing. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very serious threat that requires focused uh, uh, attention and, and focused action in the short term. But also that has to go hand in hand with education. We have to educate our youth to understand that you know, terrorism you know, violence is, is totally unacceptable. Doesn't, it cannot be justified under any circumstances. But uh, we are optimistic and confident that uh, we, we, we should make progress uh, in that regard. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Let's open the floor to questions. I would like to bring a microphone to the uh, Prime Minister of Kazakhstan here to the front row. Uh, Maya Tukhan, would you like to weigh into the debate? First, let's go to the Prime Minister of Kazakhstan here. <laughs> if we can get a second microphone. To, uh, that I, we can have. Do we have other questions from the floor? Because we have about five or six minutes, and I want to make sure we uh, address it. It'd be interesting to get, uh, Prime Minister, your perspective here. A neighbor of Russia engaged in a uh, European uh, zone with Russia, the Eurasia economic zone. Uh, it's not an easy time economically for Kazakhstan with oil prices down, commodity prices down, and your neighbor having very difficult time of uh, sanctions as well. How do you contend with it as a very large country at the center, which anchored its future to Russia at the same time? 
thank you very much for the opportunity <clears throat> to speak to you. I would like to, 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 to have an answer a little bit broader, not just uh, our Eurasian Economic Union, which was started uh, January 4th this year. It was a very interesting discussion about the price for oil and the changes, uh, structural changes in, in the world. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, this year price for oil will be low, and next week we are planning to go to the parliament with the changes for the budget for $50. We think the average price for oil in 2015 will be $48, $50. And we uh, look at this uh, current situation on the price for energy, uh, not to compare with, with 08 or 09, with the temporary uh, changes on the price for oil. We look at uh, the structural changes, like it was in uh, uh, 84, 89, when the price for oil fell down from $30 to $10 per barrel, which is $140 in, in today's terms. And the price for oil, except, uh, the, due, except the time of 91 during the war in the Gulf, it come up to the level of $30 per barrel only 20 years later, on, only in 2004. That's why what is happening right now is not a short term, it's a long term. It's um, structural changes. And we made a decision, and actually uh, yesterday we signed an agreement with the OECD for country strategy program, and uh, we made a decision that Kazakhstan uh, will be a full member of OECD, whatever it takes. And I think the structural reforms during this hard time is very important, and this is a unique opportunity for us, for, for Kazakhstan. And uh, we believe we are constantly in a, a discussion with uh, our uh, strategic partners, with uh, our friends uh, from, from Russia, that uh, they have the same idea, that structural reforms needed for Russia as well, as well as it is needed for Kazakhstan. Uh, with China, uh, we, uh, in, in December we had a visit of uh, Prime Minister Li, and a couple of days ago uh, we had a discussion here in uh, uh, Davos as well. Uh, we will have a joint program for uh, economic belt for New Silk Road, and we agree that it will be quite a heavy investment into the diversification of the economy in Kazakhstan, which will be linked to the Chinese economy, but at the same time, we have a, quite a good uh, opportunity for the whole market with, with Russia uh, and Kazakhstan. I just need to have you wrap up in the next 30 seconds, if I may. Yeah, okay. Making this long story short, I think this is a unique opportunity for emerging markets to, to restructure the economy mm. and to get a growth, not in 2015, but to get a growth later, but more stable. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the input. Uh, Finance Minister... Uh, Amaya Tukan, uh, your import costs for energy have gone down. We have about a minute for your interjection. What did you learn from the panel here? And of course, Jordan sits on the doorstep of ISIS as well. There's a regional security threat. You're trying to get growth of 4% this year. What's the most important point for you in 2015? I really think um, 2015 should be good for oil importers, of course, uh, including Jordan. We are an oil importer. It's working. Yeah. Uh, so by and large, the decline in, in oil price to 50 or 40 clearly should be good for the global economy. Um, um, of course, oil producers may face some uh, challenges regarding the revenues for the budget. But um, uh, what worries me really is that this decline in oil price, as well as what the ECB did yesterday, monetary easing or fiscal stimulus in some countries are making people complacent. Already we have people in my country saying, let's relax the reforms and uh, given this favorable circumstance. This is a serious issue. The, the other point I just want to make is that it seems the, um, the traditional um, measures to, to achieve growth, which is capital spending, or investment spending is not working anymore as expected. We're not creating jobs. And um, mm. what seems to be, maybe it should be timely to think of looking at the, at the history of, of, the re, of the modern history, we need a major technological breakthrough to create jobs. Uh, because the traditional capital spending um, targeting um, uh, capital uh, projects is not working. It's not creating enough jobs. And maybe it's time to think of a more 
um, uh, un non-traditional uh, ways to create jobs and, and achieve growth. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Tukan. In fact, uh, the International Labor Organization came out with its youth unemployment report this, uh, this week, and the pressure after the Arab Spring only made matters worse, as everybody knows. But the youth unemployment rate is nearly 30%. The Middle East or North Africa, it is a crisis, as you are suggesting. Any other questions from the floor? We have about a minute before we wrap. Please, we can get a microphone here. And there's a, and there's one here. I, I have to ask you, because I promised the Deputy Prime Minister he would be out of here now. So thank let's keep it much. direct. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And thank I want you. to thank you very much, the panel. I will request uh, Morris Levy uh, about his vision on India and China. But he has experience on the, you know, the recently we had the a, a plan of that Silk Route. You know, the Silk Route, when I was in New York, I was the, attending the Silk Route, and I got this message to go to G20 meeting. And it took off, and China is uh, financing 40 billion on this particular deal. So I was wondering, China, India, as the world is changing around, everybody talks about these two countries. What is your vision on this particular? We have a new prime minister in India. He's trying to jumpstart the economy. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. We have a new prime minister in India who exactly. seems to be uh, addressing uh, all the major issues. But you know that uh, part of the problem in India, there are many problems. But one very important problem is infrastructure. And it is uh, a shame to see that uh, uh, India has not yet been able to build some uh, very uh, modern infrastructure. The other problem is uh, the problem we know about corruption. Uh, but uh, when you look at the whole aspect of India, there is a lot of reason why you should be uh, very positive about the country. We have just made a very important investment. India will be our second country in terms of the size of our headcount. Uh, the number one country will be the US with roughly 30,000 people. Mm. In India, we will have 13,000 people. And then come uh, China with uh, uh, seven or 8,000 people. And France is becoming uh, our fourth country in terms of size. So you see that uh, we are believing in India and we are investing. So I think. Uh, uh, provided that you address the real issues and that you address this issue very seriously and without any complacency, I think uh, you will have uh, the support of the investors. Okay, final interjection from the floor. Excuse me, I, I have to wrap up. Sorry about that. I don't mean to be rude. We can talk after. Final interjection very quickly, please. Um, yes, I'm Sagal from uh, Mogadishu, Somalia. I'm a member of a uh, young global chamber uh, community. I, my question is, Mr. Mutebe. Um, we've seen a lot of help coming from um, Africa, uh, especially when it comes security. Um, but also, there are so many other helps and approaches coming from other countries, from, uh, for example, Turkey. And also, we see now a new investing uh, opportunities from China. When are we seeing? African money coming to Somalia in, when it comes to businesses and, 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 and economic growth, other than the security contribution that they have right now. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I mean, uh, we, we're very confident of the future of uh, East Africa and, and Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan. And uh, one of our companies is indeed looking at uh, those parts of the world. And there's a new breed of entrepreneurs from Nigeria, from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, young entrepreneurs, small businesses, but also significant uh, companies, some of them in partnership with uh, Chinese, American, European. And so you will see a significant amount of uh, investments in the medium to long term. OK, very quickly, 30 seconds. Uh, for, for Somalia, just an example, actually. But if we really have some dedication and some good target of work, the progress could be real fast. When we, had, we started the scheduled flights to Mogadishu, the Mogadishu airport was listed as terminally closed. Okay. So we had to rebuild the airport, the road from yeah, airport to downtown, build, now building three hospitals yeah. and so forth. Uh, and I think if that psychological barrier is passed and if the population and the outside help is united, then it becomes a very strong answer to 
terror and violence and so forth, which has been demonstrated, I think, in a very nice way recently in Somalia. Thank you very much. I uh, want to thank our deputy prime ministers for the uh, great interjections in our entire panel. Thank you for the inputs from the floor, prime minister and finance minister in particular. Uh, a nice round of applause, and thank you very, very much for your time. <laughs>